he said, she said. Yep, it's the old he said, she said situation. Attributing dialogue is an important part of the dialogue game. We spoke a little bit about dialogue tags in the previous lessons, but there's a bit more to say about them. The issue is oft discussed in writerly circles, and I think my favorite writing on this topic comes from Stephen King's On Writing, both because he offers some sage advice and also because he does so humorously, and there's no better way than humor to get a point across. King seems to hate adverbs, and I mean harbors a genuine animosity toward this part of speech. All writers seem to have their little quirks. A very well-respected poet, teaching a workshop I once attended, called adjectives the pot-bellied pig of poetry. I thought that was pretty funny. Fiction writers on the whole seem to have a much friendlier relationship with adjectives, but adverbs? There's no shortage of vitriol directed at adverbs by noted fiction writers. When I first read King's impassioned case to strike adverbs from his reader's writing, I was a bit miffed by the animosity. And then I taught a fiction writing class and read the slush piles at a literary magazine, and I got it. This is a very common issue that predictably appears in developing writer's fiction, especially in dialogue tags. What's so bad about adverbs? King lumps adverbs into his discussion of overattribution in dialogue. He's also no big fan of overly descriptive verbs. What does King mean by this exactly? He gives a few tongue-in-cheek examples like, Put it down, she shouted menacingly. Give it back, he pleaded abjectly. It's mine. Don't be such a fool, Jekyll, Utterson said contemptuously. Put the gun down, Utterson, Jekyll grated. Never stop kissing me, Shana gasped. You damn tease, Bill jerked out. Don't do these things, please, oh please, King begs desperately. See what I did there? Of course you did. And you probably have a good idea of what Stephen's getting at. Essentially, the issue here is with redundancy. The tags are merely reiterating what the dialogue implies more than adequately. Often, newer writers will add an adverb or an uncommon verb to make sure their readers are getting the manner with which the character uttered the dialogue. It's understandable, but not particularly effective. One of the reasons for this is that often, by the time the reader gets to the adverb or descriptive verb in the tag, they've already read and simulated the character speaking the words. By this point, they've decided the way the character has performed that speech act. Let's use this one as an example. Put it down, she shouted menacingly. By the time the reader gets to shouted menacingly, the reader already knows this. So, Best case scenario, this descriptive tag is only confirming what the reader already knows. Worst case scenario would be if the reader misreads how the narrator intended the dialogue to be interpreted. Let's say it goes like this. Put it down, she whispered in a hushed tone. Well, now all the tag is doing is creating dissonance in the reader's mind. If a character needs to whisper something with emphasis... There should be something in the context that cues this, like a teller during a bank robbery admonishing one of the hostages to put down his phone before he gets everyone killed. And if the reader doesn't already know this from the context, it's best to mention how the teller said the words before the speech act. Like so. The teller looked over at the gunman, and then whispered to the man in the corner with the cell phone, Put it down. King, unsurprisingly, chalks up the tendency of newer writers to overattribute to fear. I mean, what else would Stephen King say? Fear, obviously. I actually think he's dead on. Seriously, Ro? Dead on? Horror puns? From the myriad examples I've seen from less experienced writers, it almost always seems to be a desire to make sure the readers are getting it. This instinct is natural and a good one to have. It's a hell of a lot better than not giving a damn whether their readers are on the same page. But to understand why this sin of overattribution grates on the nerves of Stephen and so many other writers and readers, I'm going to bring in another expert on an entirely different aspect of books. Chip Kidd is a graphic designer who has been in the business of creating book covers for a long time. If you're familiar with the Jurassic Park T-Rex logo, you're familiar with his work, even if you didn't know it till now. Kidd gave a very funny TED talk about book design, and he started it off by stating, The very first day of my graphic design training at Penn State University, 
The teacher, Lanny Samis, came into the room and he drew a picture of an apple on the blackboard and wrote the word apple underneath. And he said, okay, lesson one, listen up. And he covered the picture and he said, you either say this or you show this, but you don't do this because this is treating your audience like a moron. Cut straight to the point, doesn't it? That's what's at the heart of why overattribution rubs so many readers the wrong way. This illustration has worked so well in my writing classes that I almost never see overattribution in my students' writing once they understand the concept in these terms. In fact, the term apple apple has become shorthand with my students for these redundant points in their writing. And now I can just underline something and write apple apple and poof, there goes the overwrought dialogue tag. This certainly isn't the worst thing you could do as a writer. King himself admits to doing a bit of it in his earlier days. If you want to see some apple appling by a very famous writer, check out This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Even writers of Fitz's stature have partaken at some point. I think the volume of amateurist fiction that is littered with these redundancies is reason enough to mention it and demonstrate why it's a bad habit to perpetuate. It's also an easy one to avoid once you're aware. An excellent way to see how you're doing on this front is to simply go back through a piece of dialogue you've written and strike any tag that isn't she said, he said, it said, or whatever character said, and replace them with those appellations instead. Then see how it reads. And again, these are conventions and not rules. If you go back to that snippet of dialogue from Joyce Carol Oates, you'll notice that almost all of the tags are he said, except the last one, Connie said in disgust. Is that technically an apple apple as we've discussed it here? Probably yes, but I'm not about to cast aspersions at the likes of Joyce Carol Oates for something that's a little bit borderline in a flawlessly written piece of dialogue. It's fiction littered with apple apples everywhere that starts to grate on readers' nerves. I'm sure Stephen would agree, all things in moderation, especially apples. Part two of this Don't Do That lesson on dialogue involves expository dialogue. When you hear the sentence, tell me something I don't know, you're usually hearing someone express exasperation at a person who, in Chip's kid's words, is treating their audience like a moron. No one likes to be told what they already know as if it were a revelation. But what does this have to do with fiction? Expository dialogue appears in mediocre or bad fiction often, and more often at the beginning of stories as the rules of the story world are being established. Its purpose is to advance the story by presenting information to the reader that the reader needs but doesn't yet know. It isn't a bad instinct, but it produces bad fiction if it happens implausibly or too often. Here's why. Carlos entered Victoria's office with a copy of the magazine open to the article. Have you seen this, he said, thrusting the article into her hands. Not yet, Victoria said as she observed the picture of a jungle landscape behind an ornate font that read, Hot on the trail of the Amazonian horde. Well, what do you think, Carlos exclaimed. I don't know what to think yet. I haven't read the article. It's everything we've been waiting for. It's possible, Victoria said. But we've been burned by this stash three times already, Carlos. If we keep running down every false lead, our investors may get restless. But it's the Amazonian horde, boss. It could be worth billions. That's true, Carlos. Good point. After all, you are the best treasure hunter in the Western Hemisphere, Victoria. What would it look like if someone else were to find it while we were sitting here in Chicago? Okay, Carlos, you're right. Let's go for it, Victoria said her face beginning to brighten. You get the plane tickets, and I'll get my bullwhip and aviator jacket out of storage. Let's go to the Amazon. This, of course, is cringeworthy dialogue. But why is this so bad? It isn't overcooked. It's a plausible representation of how people speak. I haven't overtly stretched the conventions of dialogue attribution. There aren't any blatant apple apples, as we spoke of earlier. But it's pretty bad, and you know it's bad even if you can't put your finger on why. The problem is what I mentioned earlier. These characters are telling each other things they both already know. You're the best treasure hunter in the Western Hemisphere isn't something anyone would ever plausibly say to the best treasure hunter in the Western Hemisphere, because both characters would already know it. 
It exists not to present a portrayal of two characters exchanging information with each other, but as a tool the writer uses to explain the situation to the reader. There's already a tool for that. It's called exposition. Telling, or summary, are two other ways we've put this before. The better move here would be for the narrator to relate the information outside the dialogue. That way, Carlos and Victoria can have a realistic conversation about whether they should go chasing after the Amazonian horde for a fourth time. I mean, as realistic as such a fictional conversation about fictional Amazonian gold could go. Dialogue is about characters exchanging ideas in a plausibly similar way to how people exchange ideas for the same purposes, because I know something you don't, and vice versa. This, of course, is not to say that characters shouldn't ever do this. A character, just like a person, may need to be reminded of something relevant they might be overlooking. Or maybe they're recounting something known as a justification for their behavior or reasoning. This is also a convention that can be reasonably breached for the right reasons, within the context of a plausible conversation. Knowing why expository dialogue is frowned upon by good writers will help you to keep it out of your writing when it's happening for the wrong reasons. The right tool for the right job, as my father would say. And conveying necessary information to the reader generally falls under exposition, not dialogue. You are such a long-winded gas bag and narrative geek, Roe, the reader said. This much is true, Roe huffed indignantly. But at least I'm not apple-appling or using dialogue when I should be using exposition to make my point instead. But you're doing both of those things, the reader exclaimed in exasperation. Tell me something I don't know. <laughs>